Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. We're going to talk today about the subject of KYC. What is KYC? Uh, how does it affect you? And you know, is there anything that you can do to take advantage of optimizing? So KYC stands for Know Your Client. It is super common in the financial industry. If you've ever opened a bank account, you've encountered it. If you've ever done a bunch of other things, you've probably encountered it. Uh, you may find that it's a little bit of a bane of your existence. And that being said, I think that we should view KYC a little bit like credit today. Okay, so if you're in a country that has sophisticated credit systems, for instance, Canada, the US, etc., uh, by not understanding the credit system and by not working with the credit system, you can put yourself at a major disadvantage. So for instance, uh, right now as I'm sitting here writing this, this is you know June 2020. I'm not writing this, I'm <laughs> recording this. And there's all sorts of different protests around the Black Lives Matter movement. And one of the kind of subjects that has come up in this discourse is the idea that black people statistically get uh, disapproved for mortgages or rejected for mortgages more frequently than white people do. Okay. And so the question is, well, why is this? You know, it, there's a whole conversation about the red line that took place back in the day and all this kind of stuff. But uh, if you look into it, what the banks will say is they're like, hey, look, this is, if you control for the other variables, uh, what the reason for what's going on here has nothing to do with racism. It has to do with uh, credit ratings, okay? And, you know, so this kind of comes into the subject of, all right, you, if you misunderstand the credit system, or if you come from a culture where the credit system uh, doesn't really recognize your set of behaviors, you're gonna be at a disadvantage in a society where credit systems are really important. Oh, maybe there's some light in there, I don't know. Uh, it's been very rainy. Anyway, so let me give you an example of this. Uh, good friends of mine, actually a number of people that I know, my wife included, tend not to believe in debt and credit, all right? So if you're that type of person, you may be a very responsible individual who pays their bills on time, et cetera, but they simply don't borrow money and they simply don't, aren't using credit cards, et cetera. Well, what does that mean? That means that they're gonna have poor credit history because there's simply a lack of data about their payments because what is reported and recorded and analyzed by the credit bureaus is simply credit products. So for instance, it typically won't include your phone bills, won't include your rent payments, won't include your uh, utility payments, etc. right? And so you may have really good payment history, but that's not reflected on your file. If you simply have never taken out credit, you're gonna have a poor credit score. So it disadvantages a certain group of people based on their culture, who are actually a good credit risk. Now, on the flip side is it creates an opportunity for lenders who see that, hey, there's this underserved portion of the market who are actually very credit worthy, but our credit systems aren't accounting for that. And, you know, hopefully over time, the efficiency of the system will account for that. And, you know, somebody will make a lot of money off it probably uh, by being able to assess the credit risk of those people more accurately and being able to make loans accordingly. But in the meantime, there's a certain group of people who are going to be disadvantaged. Right. Something is similar when it comes to KYC, know your client. If you uh, come from a part of the world, and I first encountered this quite a number of years ago, maybe, I don't know, eight years ago or something, where there were clients of ours who were living in a part of the world where you simply did not have certain documentation. So I'm going to give you an example, which is very frequently, so know your client starts with identifying who is the person who we are dealing with. That's really kind of the essence of it, right? And so, you know, usually this involves providing some identification, uh, usually a passport, possibly birth certificate, driver's license, you know, whatever, some sort of a piece of documentation, possibly multiple pieces of documentation to confirm your identity. And nowadays they do, you know, video calls, you may do an in-person meeting, you may, you know, these sorts of things. So you've got that. But then the next thing is frequently you have a component which is related to your place of habitation, right? Where do you live? What's your address? And this is usually defined by uh, a, uh, like a utility bill. Now, in all honesty, this is kind of a farce, the way that it's handled. It, I, I've just seen so much ridiculousness around how companies handle this. It's pathetic. Now, you can understand, to some extent, if you're a bank, why this is important, right? And the first reason that that is important is, hey, listen, maybe I have to send you a bank card, I have to send you a security token, something like this. And if it arrives at the wrong place, 
then somebody may have access to your account or your money, and that's really dangerous, right? So we, don't, we wanna make sure that where we're sending it is legitimate, right? So that's the first part. And if somebody was to steal your documentation, right? Then, so they say, let's say they take your passport, you know, identity theft is a big, big crime rising in the world today, right? So they take identity theft, then they go and they put a different address on it, and they say, okay, great, now we're gonna send this we're going to sign up for a bank account or we're going to sign up for a credit card or something like that and then we're going to have the card etc shipped to this other address where we can control it right big big problem there so you can understand the mindset of a bank in saying hey i want to verify where you live the problem is in many cases uh, you will not have a utility bill in your name right you're renting say you're in some part of the world and it's just normal that the landlord pays all the bills and you just reimburse the landlord. Well, then what do you do, right? So I've seen cases that are just insane where, okay, they won't accept your telephone bill. All right, they won't accept, you know, I've actually had this uh, dealing with being here in Bulgaria. So a, a bunch of my documentation is in Bulgarian, right? So this creates a problem because they can't read it. So even if it says legitimately what they need, they won't have it. I have my, uh, my ID card, my residency card, and, uh, and on that, you know, it has my address. Well, that won't qualify as one of the things that they accept as a proof of address, right? So you're like, okay, well, this is nonsense, right? It's because, okay, how do you pay your bills? Okay, so then you go and you look at, all right, well, maybe the bank has your old address on the bank statement or something like this. I've seen clients have had to deal with this. It's just a bunch of nonsense. And unfortunately, it pushes people into a corner and ends up causing all kinds of issues. And in some cases, I've dealt with banks where what it is that they have done to help get around it, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, and they'll fuss over really, really stupid things. So unfortunately, what we have in the world today is a lot of rules that do not make anybody safer. They simply are checking a box. And I'm a big critic of those types of things. I think it's just bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake, and it's nonsense and they need to come up with better systems. But that being said, for you, if you know this, you may think, hey, I'm going to do something to ensure that I have an address and a proof of address all the time that I can give to a bank if I need it, right? The next thing might be you may want some sort of reference letters, right? So uh, longer term relationships with banks, with accountants, with lawyers, some sort of professionals who can vouch for you. This is important. Keeping around documentation to show the history of your business. So this gets into just asinine insane things like sometimes there are banks who will ask for the history of some client maybe it was like an 80 year old guy who has a business uh, when he was in Germany in the 40s and they're asking him for proof of that well who has that stuff you know like it's just unbelievable but that is the level that it has gone to and so what does this tell you it tells you hey look it's probably a good idea if I make a point of documenting things and I maintain that documentation over time so that if something happens, I can provide records of this, right? So this is on the personal side, right? We're talking about, okay, identifying who you are, right? Being able to prove who you are with multiple pieces of ID that match, right? Uh, and ideally are in the right languages, et cetera. You may need to get them certified by some body. Number two, being able to provide utility bills, which are in the language that's appropriate. They may need to be certified, although very often not. Uh, being able to provide reference letters, okay, these things. Uh, the next thing is source of wealth, right? Being able to say, hey, where is it that my wealth came from? Sometimes this may mean you need to provide a tax return, you may, may, uh, may need to provide a tax ID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of that process like keeping that documentation around, being able to show, hey, I made this money, hey, I sold this thing, etc. You know, some people like to get rid of documents. My mom was calling me the other day and she was saying, hey, you know, I have some of your documents here. Can I get rid of them? They're old from whatever it is, I don't know, 2011 or something. I'm like, you know what? You should probably keep those around. It's probably a better idea because you just never know what's going to come up. So these are examples of just where, on the personal front, that can be helpful. Now let's go on to the business side, right? And on the business side, you can kind of understand to a greater extent that a bank or a payment processor or something like that may have some concerns of like, okay, is this a legitimate company, right? So obviously they're gonna ask for updated documents. They're gonna to wanna to see that that company has been formed uh, or that the current uh, directors and shareholders 
are the ones who are listed in the documents. Okay, so you get register of directors, register of shareholders, you get certificate of incumbency, certificate of good standing, things like this. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you maybe when you're building a corporate structure, you're going to think, hey, where can I easily get these? And for countries, they should be making these things more easily available, right? So, for example, the UK with the company's house has been quite efficient about doing this. They've been kind of on the leading edge. And so that's great, right? If you can provide this information, it makes things much easier. Whereas on the other hand, if you have, say, a Delaware company, it can often be difficult to get the documentation that you need in order to demonstrate some of these things to foreign governments because they're not used to it, right? So for instance, if you were to move to Bulgaria, I'm in Bulgaria right now, uh, you can get something called a Type D visa on the basis of registering what's called a trade representative office uh, of a foreign company in Bulgaria, okay? You need to provide the documentation for the company, that's fair enough, no problems. But if you have a Delaware company or a New Mexico company or something like this, there's a, it's often really difficult to get documentation that meets the standards of Bulgaria. Okay, so yet another issue, right? So these sorts of things, we just kind of layer them on top of each other and add up and it can create a bunch of hassles. So the, the bottom line of this is knowing your customer is all about these different kind of proof points. And if you're aware, okay, hey, I should probably have a domain. I should probably have a website. The website should probably have these things that match. It's helpful if I'm registered on Google. It's helpful, you know, you can just start running down the list of factors that help to solidify for them to know, oh yeah, these guys are who they say they are. Hey, here's our office. You can come and check the office out. Uh, I was reading over the bank risk requirements recently for uh, suspicious activity or uh, suspicious, specific, uh, suspicious transactions. And uh, in this particular bank anyway, one of the things that was relevant was, hey, have you visited their office? Do you know that they really have an office? And obviously this is a way where banks are kind of out of date because increasingly, you know, you have people operating remotely. We're just kind of coming out of this whole Corona thing, or at least the lockdown portion of it. And what's one of the things that we saw? A lot more people working from home. Probably more people will work from home in the future, right? That being said, in the absence of that, what can you do to show the bank that things are legitimate. It's really hard to open bank accounts today. I really, we open bank accounts for clients, so if you, you need help, reach out to us. You know, we're happy to help you get banking. Uh, and you know, it's unfortunately something that's really challenging today. And it's annoying to me because on the one hand, it's not really even worth it for us. Like we can't charge enough to clients to make it really worth our time, but at the same time they need it, so we have to do it, right? So I would sort of rather that people learn, okay, here's how to put together a proper package, here's the things to make it so the bank can feel really confident about what it is that they're doing, what, how they're dealing with you, and as a result, they can operate accordingly. So anyway, I hope that's helpful to you, I hope it's interesting. If you enjoyed it, please click the subscribe button, click the notification bell, like this video. Uh, if you have some questions, put some your notes in the comments. Uh, check out our websites, offshorecapitalist.com, offshorecitizen.net. Uh, if you want to book a call with us, you can do so on clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer, or there's links on both those other websites. If you want help with you know, your taxes, asset protection, citizenships, residencies, banking, etc., reach out to us, and I'm going to see you guys on the next video.